I've said it before, most supplements are a waste of money, but not all of them. What about beta alanine? It's in a lot of supplement compounds and it's got that tingle, but does it actually help you get stronger? Let's find out. Hey, Gray Steel Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription. One of our most popular videos is our piece on creatine supplementation. In that piece, I discussed one of the few supplements that I find even partially beneficial for the athlete of aging and how it works. Creatine improves anaerobic energy metabolism, allowing us to work in a high power range just a little bit longer. Creatine doesn't directly make us stronger. It allows us to extend the set by another rep or two so we can get stronger. Creatine is well studied and safe. I wouldn't go so far as to say I recommend it, but I use it and I certainly don't discourage it. Beta alanine is also a popular supplement and it's commonly used with creatine in supplement compounds. I'll tell you up front that I use such a preparation and I feel like it helps, which of course is most definitely not evidence. Since most of you have heard of it, many of you have asked about it, and some of you actually use it too, I thought it would be expedient to explore what we know about this popular and ubiquitous supplement. When you take beta alanine, it actually doesn't really do anything for you, except make you feel all tingly in a way that some find vaguely agreeable in a warm and fuzzy way, and that others compare to being plunged into an Olympic swimming pool full of centipedes and Tabasco. This tingle, agreeable or not, is apparently harmless and appears to be an epiphenomenon resulting from the binding of beta alanine to certain receptors on sensory neurons. The sensation has absolutely no beneficial impact on physical performance or anything else, as far as we can tell. The benefit of beta alanine, which is technically an atypical amino acid, comes from its participation in the synthesis of an important muscle dipeptide, basically a very short protein, called carnosine. The manufacture of carnosine in muscle cells is limited by the availability of beta alanine, which is not stored to any appreciable degree and has very low concentrations in serum unless the diet is high in meat or supplemented. When available, beta alanine is combined with a more abundant amino acid, histidine, to form carnosine. And that's the ticket because it's carnosine that's doing the heavy lifting, so to speak. Carnosine is a big deal for a number of reasons but the most important appears to be its ability to act as a buffer. Now, in chemistry, a buffer stabilizes the pH of a solution against the addition of an acid or a base. Let's take an example. If you have a glass of water and drip in a strong acid, you will find that the pH drops rapidly. The solution rapidly becomes more acidic. Or, if you drip in a strong base, the pH will rise rapidly. The solution rapidly becomes more alkaline. But if you have a buffered solution, it will resist those precipitous changes in pH when you add a strong acid or base. Buffers are just huge in biology because many reactions in cells generate alkali or acid. And chief among these for our purposes are the reactions of energy metabolism, particularly fast glycolysis, the anaerobic process that rapidly splits glucose to form ATP without the participation of oxygen generating pyruvate and hydrogen ion, or pyruvic acid, in the process. The hydrogen ion, or proton, is the acid part of this mess, and as it accumulates in a hard-working muscle cell, the change in pH will make it harder and harder for the enzymes and other compounds involved in energy production to keep going. Your muscles will burn and fatigue, and you'll stop because, really, who needs this crap? Fortunately, you have buffers like bicarbonate and phosphate and the buffering capacity of proteins themselves to retard and blunt the acidification of hardworking muscle. But every little bit helps, and so it is that bicarbonate is a common form of doping to increase the buffering capacity of muscle. Delaying and blunting the drop in pH during high-intensity effort allows us to continue that effort just a little longer. And that's where carnosine comes in. Carnosine is an effective cellular buffer in muscle tissue sopping up protons that are generated in abundance when we're exercising, particularly in the high power anaerobic range, although we also generate proton during aerobic exercise and anytime we use ATP. By buffering protons, 
carnosine blunts the acidification of muscle during exercise. Now, beta alanine supplementation has been decisively shown to chronically increase muscle carnosine concentration if taken at a dose of 4 to 6 grams per day over several weeks. The tingling that you feel after a big oral dose doesn't mean that it's working or that you've made a bunch of carnosine yet or that you're ready for a PR. It just means you took some beta alanine. But regular supplementation will increase your muscle carnosine levels, which raises the important question. So what? Well, there is evidence that beta alanine supplementation sufficient to improve muscle carnosine levels improves performance, but only specific kinds of performance. Our best data suggests that athletes will see a benefit in high power performances lasting longer than 60 seconds and less than about four minutes. This makes total sense if you remember what we've had to say in the past about energy metabolism. When we engage in exercise, we have an anaerobic immediate system that consists of the ATP already in our muscles, which will generate high power for a couple of seconds, and an anaerobic creatine cycle that will continue that high power for another minute or so, and an anaerobic fast glycolytic system that will generate moderately high power by splitting sugar and releasing acid rapidly for just a couple of minutes. And finally, a low power, moderate power aerobic system that burns oxygen and can go for about 95 years or so if need be. If you're still here and still awake, you can see why carnosine would work best in the 60 second to 240 second range. For shorter durations, we're generating energy without generating too much proton. For longer efforts, we're in the aerobic energy system where acid production is moderate. It's in that glycolytic window that the need to sop up acid proton becomes more acute. So, it shouldn't surprise us that beta alanine supplementation works best for sprinters, wrestlers, gymnasts, boxers, and the like. What about strength training? Here the data is a little bit more mixed. It's easy to see how carnosine levels would not have much effect on a heavy single, double, or triple set, lasting less than 60 seconds. It's also easy to see how carnosine might permit longer sets like 8s or 15s or more and it may increase the ability to sustain longer workouts. Analogous to creatine, it doesn't make us stronger, but it may extend work capacity so we can get stronger. Even so, the data on beta alanine seems to be in equipoise, which is a nice way of saying that it's a mess, and on my read, the data for its enhancement of strength training is not strong. The study most relevant to Grayseal viewers is the RCT by Bailey et al. in the Journal of Dietary Supplements in 2018, entitled, Beta Alanine Does Not Enhance the Effects of Resistance Training in Older Adults. That's not very encouraging, I know. I do love it when the title spells out what the authors found, unless they didn't really find anything, which I believe is the case here. This paper is exemplary of the usual woeful deficiencies in this literature. This was a pathetically small trial, and it was a bit short, but perhaps with enough time to show clinical differences. No assessment was made of muscle carnosine concentration, which is critically important in this case, as the investigators used about half the usual dose, and participants were expected to self-administer the supplement. So we don't know the compliance rate. And we don't know if the regimen here actually boosted muscle carnosine. The subjects got a little stronger, but the effect sizes were not great, and there was no detection of an effect of beta alanine. That's no shocker, since the authors conducted no power analysis to show that their study was even big enough to detect the difference. My technical term for this is total loserness. A power analysis is so fundamental that when I don't see one, I know that it's amateur hour. Combined with the standard but goofy low-dose resistance training employed in this study, there just isn't a lot that Grayscale athletes can learn from this. It's a shame. Where does this leave those of us who want more from life than a stimulating and slightly creepy, tingly feeling? Well, it's important to point out that carnosine has other effects besides buffering. It seems to improve the movement of calcium in muscle during work, which is a big deal, and it also seems to sop up free radicals generated by exercise, which could contribute to improved performance, or could actually be bad by blunting intrinsic muscle buffering capacity. 
Finally, there is a suggestion in the literature that carnosine can inhibit a process called protein glycosylation, which is the nonspecific and harmful attachment of sugar molecules to proteins. This process is associated with aging, and we would rather not have it going on in our cells. What is the long-term health benefit of this property of carnosine, if any? We don't know. So what's the bottom line? As I noted earlier, I use beta alanine and I think it helps me, but this is a subjective impression, further clouded by its combination with creatine. Beta alanine isn't free, and it does have the harmless but potentially disagreeable side effect of paresthesias or tingling. And even if it does help, it probably isn't a huge effect. A recent meta-analysis calculated a median effect of about 2.85% improvement in an exercise measure with beta alanine supplementation when doses were adequate. Whoa, daddy. So you can give beta alanine a try without having to worry too much about safety and without having to hope for huge gains either because they're unlikely. If you are observant and precise and assiduous with your logging, you may be able to determine that it helps you or you may not. If you take it, it may give you a bit of a boost with longer sets or longer workouts. If you don't take it, you probably aren't missing much. As always, the fundamentals are more important. Stick to your program, eat your pre and post workouts, get your active rest and sleep, and you'll be doing far more for your health and performance than any pill or powder can ever do.